Right. Thank you, Gordon. And thank you certainly all for coming in from that beach. is absolutely splendid. I, I arrived on Sunday, so I had a chance to go yesterday. But it'll be there at the end of the week. If you look at the weather, it's going to be there. Right. So I have to be, I'm told I have to stay near this mic because it's being recorded and I'm really bad at that. So if I start wandering down there, tell me to go back. Okay. So the with the first talk of the afternoon, and actually not being sure who would be coming, I thought, I didn't move that, so I do hope it's not on a timer. I thought I would cover initially a little bit of very general introduction, so I would guess that since you've all come to the Glyco 23 meeting, you probably don't need it, but just a few slides to help introduce how we use glycomics, which is going to be the focus of the talk. So because I had to choose what I was going to focus on with respect to how our technology works, and obviously we can't cover everything, the main focus of the talk today is on N-glycosylation, particularly mammalian N-glycosylation. So I do apologize for all those who are not that interested in mammalian N-glycosylation. However, I am planning to only talk for about half an hour, so that gives those of you who are not in this category time to ask questions about everything else. So then, once we've got that little bit of background under our belts, I'll focus on how cell and tissue glycomics can help us to understand, together with those who are working on the biology, the function of glycans. And I will touch on the strategies that we use, they're not the only strategies, and you will be encountering others during the meeting, but what I'll be focusing on are the strategies that we use and the context that we use them in. And then a little bit at the end on glycoproteomics, again, there's quite a few talks at the meeting that cover this kind of topic, so I'm trying not to cover areas that I know that you will be encountering later on. And let's see whether I can get this to work, and the answer is no. So, Gordon, are you still here? Do you know what you do apart from pressing this arrow? And do you have to point it at anything? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the basic textbook picture that everybody uses when they're teaching glycobiology to students to highlight the fact, and I'm sure there mustn't be many people, if any, in the audience who are not aware of this, that the surface of all cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, this of course is a eukaryotic white blood cell, is coated with a layer of sugars, a so-called glycocalyx. Those sugars are attached to proteins and lipids, and again, the focus today is on glycans attached to proteins, just because of the time, not suggesting in any way that they are more important than the glycolipids. But I just want to flag here, for those who haven't perhaps thought about the three-dimensional structure of sugars, that very often, certainly those outside the glycobiology field, particularly protein chemists, often dismiss the sugar that is attached to proteins because they say, oh, it's only 5%, 10% of the total mass molecular weight of the glycoprotein. And of course, they couldn't be more wrong with respect to the potential biological significance. And that's highlighted here with a moderately accurate, not totally accurate picture, but moderately accurate picture of one of the domains of a blood protein called von Willebrand factor, which is about 35 kilodaltons in size. This is a reasonably accurate from crystal structure, picture of the backbone of that domain. And here are two glycans modeled on to that domain. On the left is a high mannose glycan, shown down here. If you're not familiar with that terminology, I'll come to that shortly, which is about 1.5 kilodaltons. And on the right is what we refer to as a complex type glycan, which, and I can't see it, oh yes, there I can see it, 3.7 kilodaltons. So this is about 10% of the weight of the protein, and this is about 5%. But notice in terms of hydrodynamic volume that these glycans are occupying an equivalent space to the protein. And of course, it is important to remember that from the point of view of the function. So glycans on surfaces are involved in many recognition uh, reactions, with other cells, pathogens, for example, and 
other cells often of a similar type. And that recognition is interpreted by glycan binding proteins, which are very often referred to as lectins. So again, I'm not going to be talking today about the lectins, I'm going to be talking only about the glycans, but it is important to remember that we're not just doing structures in order to say, wow, that's a nice structure. We're doing structures because we want to understand how the glycans function biologically. And of course, this, is, this isn't the only functional uh, importance of glycans, the recognition, but again, because of the focus of what I'm going to be telling you about today, which are the terminal epitopes and how to identify them, that is the main theme of the talk today. So with respect to glycomics, I've got to the age of a few of you in the audience um, where it's sometimes useful to reflect on why we are where we are today and how we got there. And modern glycomics, which effectively means analyzing glycans in mixtures to try to understand about functional significance and choosing them to analyze in mixtures, because of issues relating to the complexity of the sample and whether or not it's sensible to try to purify them. The roots of all that go back 30 or so years to mass spectrometry of the early 1980s, when, to be perfectly honest, we didn't know what we were doing and did things that if we had known what we were doing, we probably wouldn't have done. And I worked at that time a lot with a scientist at what was then the La Jolla Cancer Research Institute, uh, now the uh, Burnham Institute, it's got two names, I forgot the other name, sorry those who are here from the Burnham Institute. The, and we were looking at glycans on the cell surfaces of white blood cells and red blood cells as well and also cancer cells. And we were simply using methods that were available, were emerging at that time, particularly a technique called fast atom bombardment. And what we realized was that irrespective of the sample we were analyzing, we were reproducibly obtaining fragment ions. And if you're not a mass spec person, I'll explain a fragment ion shortly. We were reproducibly obtaining fragment ions that told us something about the non-reducing ends of our mammalian glycans. And one of the earliest experiments that we did back in the early 1980s, these are the two papers that reported on this, identified Salar Lewis X on the surface of white blood cells and also enriched on leukemia cells. Now that wasn't the earliest report of Salar Lewis X, it had been reported back in the 1970s, but this was the first time it had been seen on white blood cells. And it was a number of years later, the late 1980s, before the significance of this was understood, when the cell lectins, which are the Salar Lewis X binding lectins, were cloned, and it was realized that this epitope is important for trafficking of white blood cells and a whole variety of other biological reactions. But the key thing was that we were able to see this glycan, even though at the time, we didn't know the size of the glycans we were, look, we were looking at. Now we do. They were well over five, six, seven, eight thousand molecular weight, and the mass spectrometers of those days, in principle, couldn't, direct, couldn't detect ions of that size. But it was that initial understanding that the technology could deliver this information that subsequently led to the development of the glycomics that we now pretty much routinely use. We no longer use fast atom bombardment because that has been superseded by more uh, sensitive and more efficient ionization techniques, particularly MOLDI, matrix-assisted matrix laser desorption ionization, and I'll come to that briefly in a moment. But this slide here covers essentially the principles of what emerged from that early 1980s work and is now used widely throughout the world in glycobiology, which are the methods of glycomics and glycoproteomics. And essentially what we're saying here is that we can take a sample and it doesn't really matter how crude it is, and it doesn't have to be mammalian either. We can work with pretty much anything provided from that sample can be obtained a pool of glycans, which we're then going to analyze using our various mass spec techniques. With respect to most of the most sensitive and particularly the high mass analysis for our glycans, it's important to derivatize. 
And one of the most powerful methods of derivatization is permethylation, whereby all of the glycans are made hydrophobic before they're analyzed by the mass spec. The other really important thing which underpins glycomics is all of the hard work that many, many, many glycobiologists throughout the world did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s to understand the biosynthetic pathways. Because a lot of the mass spectrometry interpretation, in order for us to do relatively high throughput analysis, relies on knowing the biosynthetic pathways. In other words, to be able to rule out and rule in structures based on the biology as well as the mass spectrometry. And in order to understand how we do that, this is where I focus a little bit.